Welcome. Um, I'm Mike Perry. I'm the executive director of the Army Heritage Center Foundation. We're the friends group for the U.S. Army Heritage Education Center in Carlisle, uh, Pennsylvania. Uh, tonight, I'm pleased to have uh, Colonel retired Tom Vossler, one of my former bosses, uh, to, to present a webinar, not in what he's really known for, but on something that he lived uh, personally. Colonel Tom Vossler served 30 years in the U.S. Army from 1968 through 1998. He commanded an infantry platoon in combat during the Vietnam War and a mechanized infantry armor battalion task force of 1,200 American and German soldiers in Germany prior to the fall of the Berlin Wall. Tom is a graduate of Pennsylvania Military College, which he's wearing his shirt proudly today. Uh, and holds a master's degree from Georgia State University. He is a graduate of the U.S. Army War, uh, Command and General Staff College and the U.S. Army War College. Tom has taught military history, strategy, and leadership at the U.S. Army War College, and he is a former director of the U.S. Army Military History Institute at Carlisle Barracks, Pennsylvania. Since 1998, he has worked as a licensed battlefield guide at Gettysburg, where he specializes in battlefield studies and leadership seminars for U.S. military as well as military units from Germany, the United Kingdom, France, and Canada. Tom has published three books. Uh, on the American Civil War that include the Gettysburg Campaign with Carol Reardon, A Field Guide to Gettysburg with Carol Reardon, published in 2013, A Field Guide to Antietam, now in its second printing, uh, and a fourth book, which will come out on the 1st of August, called Battle-Tested Gettysburg Leader Lessons for the 21st Century Leaders. At this time, uh, I would like to uh, turn the floor over to, to Tom. I would ask that you hold your questions to the end and they use the question and answer icon to submit your questions. Tom, the floor is yours. Well, good evening, everyone. You hear me all right out there, Mike? I can hear you fine. All right, well, again, good evening. It's great to be with you here tonight. Uh, nice hot day, series of days here in uh, good old Gettysburg. Um, not quite as humid as it was 50 years ago in, uh, in Cambodia. And Cambodia is uh, our subject tonight. Um, it was, uh, being a historian, I'm a great one on, on context and putting things in context and in place. And I'm reminded of the fact that when I graduated from high school in 1964, the uh, Second World War had been over 19 years uh, by that time. And uh, uh, here it is already, it's been 50 years since uh, we uh, made the attack into the sanctuary areas of Cambodia to clean out the communist base camps that had been established there. And so I thought it would be appropriate this year that we talk, we talk about that. Uh, here on the screen, you can see in the center of the map, uh, you got Cambodia on the upper part there and Vietnam on the white part, lower part. And in between, it's a blue area. And those were the sanctuary areas established by the communists back in uh, the time of the, Indo the second Indochina War. And I ask you to think about that term, second Indochina War, because the fact that we have US troops in both Cambodia and Laos, in addition to Vietnam, makes it the Indochina War, the second one. We're gonna get into that in a little bit. There on the front, uh, uh, on either side of the map, you'll see some pictures of uh, Cambodia. Now, understand, I'm not like John Kerry. I didn't have a, a photographer, a special photographer, follow me around from point to point. I had a camera, and it one situation allowed, I took it out and would take some snapshots, and that's what some of what you're going to see tonight. Also, unlike John Kerry, I didn't wound myself with my own hand grenade to get a Purple Heart. And so, you know, that's a little bit different. So, We'll have to go with kind of these home produced uh, shots. So I mentioned Indochina, just a quick review as, as to what Indochina uh, was uh, back, in, uh, back in the former days. Uh, it, was a, it was a colony uh, of, of France, part of the colonial empire. Um, you can see there on the, on the graphic, um, 1887, the Indochinese Union under French rule gives us three regions in Vietnam, Tonkin, Annam, and Cochin, China, and then Cambodia and Laos. And uh, that is then Indochina under, under French rule for, for uh, 
well after up uh, until after the uh, the uh, first Indochina War, which will take place after the Second World War. I introduce a character here named Ho Chi Minh. Uh, you'll hear his name often here in the next uh, the next uh, few minutes. Uh, he founds the Communist uh, the Indochinese Communist Party in 1930, and establishes the Communist Viet Minh Insurgent Group in Vietnam in uh, 1941. Second World War, Vichy France rules in Indochina. Uh, remember, this is the uh, uh, not the Free French. This is uh, um, this is Vichy France uh, that allied with uh, with the uh, Axis powers. Uh, Vietnam will be occupied by about 50,000 Japanese. Uh, military personnel, Army, Air Force, and Navy. They'll establish a naval base at, at uh, Cameron Bay. And so Vietnam is under Japanese rule during uh, the Second World War. First Indochina War will begin right after that is uh, that Second World War ends with the Viet Minh insurgents, remember established uh, by Ho Chi Minh, will rise up against the, uh, against the French uh, occupation. Uh, First Indochina War expands once the Communist Chinese forces in China kick the nationalists over to Taiwan, then Communist uh, uh, advisors, uh, military advisors from China will come down and, uh, and support the Viet Minh. Korean War begins. Remember the United States then, once the Korean War begins, they're focused in a kind of a different direction. Nonetheless, uh, $15 million will be pledged to France to help France deal with this insurgency. French will be defeated uh, in May of 1954, Battle of Bien Bien Phu. If you've not read the book, uh, Hell in a Very Small Place, Bernard Fall, I think it's, uh, I commend that to you. So we have Korean War armistice in 1953. We have the French being defeated in 1954. And then in 1954, we have the Geneva Conference. And they play around with Korea a little bit. We're still playing around with Korea a little bit, aren't we? But uh, they didn't solve much there at the Geneva Conference in 1954, uh, as it involves Korea. But for Vietnam, um, Vietnam will be partitioned. The French will be forced out of uh, their former colony, uh, partitioned Vietnam at the 17th parallel, Ho Chi Minh in the north, Bao Dai in the south, uh, is uh, communist, anti-communist, and there'll be two successor states created as a result of the Geneva Accords of 1954, um, the Kingdom of Cambodia and the Kingdom of Laos, both of which will be granted international neutrality. Very important point that we'll come to here in just, just a very few minutes. Uh, U.S. involvement, we can go all the way back, we can go all the way back to, uh, to Harry Truman, Truman is involved with, uh, first of all, with money again to support France until France is, is out of the action. 1951, $150 million to support the French. A military advisory assistant group will be established the previous year to help the French um, spend, the, spend the initial $10 million and then the following $150 million. So we got money invested there. We want to see, we got a communist victory in China. We got this thing going on in Korea. And so, you know, at the, at the strategic level, at the, at the uh, presidential level, there's some interest in, in allowing, uh, um, in, 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 that is to say, to stop the, the spread of, of the communists. To the point, Eisenhower, President Eisenhower, uh, this is kind of the start of the first covert operations involving Indochina, 24 U.S. CIA pilots will covertly operate 12 uh, U.S. Air Force cargo planes in support of French. The planes will be marked with French markings. It's all in support of French operations, uh, and uh, up until the time that they are they are defeated, um, a military advisory assistant group again will be supported there. The last French troops will leave Vietnam in 19, 1956. We then move right on to President Kennedy. Kennedy will send 50,000 Special Forces soldiers, that is the Green Berets, as training teams to South Vietnamese Army. Now, oftentimes, Kennedy is earnestly reported as being the founder of 
the Special Forces, the founder of the Green Berets. No, they existed as a previous carryover from the OSS operations out of the Second World War. They were already established. What he will do is he will re-energize that force. Uh, thus, the, the uh, Special Operating uh, Force uh, uh, headquarters down at Fort Bragg is, is named in his honor. Um, Kennedy also creates the Military Assistance Command Vietnam, MACV. You'll hear MACV spoken of here in the next few minutes uh, quite a bit. So uh, Kennedy will create that and he will increase the military presence uh, from, from 1900 men in, in 1961 up to 1600 men in 63. Then, of course, he is, uh, he is uh, assassinated there in, in, uh, in 63. Johnson becomes president. President Johnson will initiate Operation Rolling Thunder, that is the U.S. Um, um, bombers going into uh, North Vietnam. And then the problem is going to be that uh, uh, those air bases will be under attack by the, uh, by the Viet Cong. So now it's time to send the ground combat troops, that's 3,500 uh, U.S. Marines, uh, to Vietnam. Uh, by 1966, we've got 385,000 U.S. troops in Vietnam. By the end of the year, by 1968, it tops off at over 500,000. So then we have President Nixon. Nixon um, promises in 68 as he campaigns for president a peace with honor. Hold on to that thought. We'll come back to that as well. He announces a policy to Vietnam uh, of Viet Vietnamization. Easy for me to say, Vietnamization, whereby we're going to strengthen the armed forces of the of the South uh, of, of South Vietnam uh, to enable them to stand on their own while we reduce the number of U.S. ground troops. Uh, and we're going to extend the ongoing pacification program. Uh, within the Viet Cong control, the regions and villages and the hamlets, and that will enable us to withdraw, except there's a problem. The problem is going to be the sanctuaries along the border of Vietnam and Cambodia. He will request in 1969 plans for limited cross-border attacks to destroy those enemy bases in the sanctuary areas of Cambodia. So the planning will begin in 1969 for what's going to come into fruition in 1970. So all of that I give up to you as background. Now, at that time, um, I was a younger man than I am now. I was a uh, uh, first lieutenant, infantry platoon leader. Platoon leader's uh, range of vision and area of influence is 1,100 yards. What's 1,100 yards? That's the maximum effective range of the two M60 machine guns he has in his 40 man platoon. So I couldn't see very far. Um, people ask me about this, me laughing, smiling there down in the swamp or actually crossing the canal. I'm laughing because I'm stuck in the mud <laughs> and the cones that I'm in command of are not, <laughs> not willing to reach down here and pull, pull their lieutenant up out of the out of the mud. The old man, as they called me, 23 years old I was, you see. I was the oldest man in the platoon at 23 years old. More on that later. And then here's some of my counterparts. I want to point out on the picture on uh, the left of my screen as I look at it, there's a young fellow with a hat on there. His name is Juan. Juan was a NVA lieutenant at one time. He was uh, shot all the pieces, survived. Uh, in a uh, um, South Vietnamese hospital, went through the Chu Hoi program, joined our ranks, and he was what we call a tiger scout. There's another tiger scout sitting there with him, the young fellow looking directly at you, kneeling down on one knee. And uh, they were tiger scouts. They were former Viet Cong NVA who saw the light, went through uh, reform school, and then fought with us. One was my personal bodyguard. When I go back, you see, when I'm telling the story, I've left out a whole uh, six months as platoon leader in the, in, the, uh, in the Delta, down in the Mekong Delta area, South Saigon. And I got some stories that I'll, I'll tell you the future day. But anyway, so the point is, uh, range of vision for a lieutenant platoon leader at that time was not very big. So I had to look for uh, the big picture. 
and I went to the big picture. I started first with the Center of Military History uh, uh, of the U.S. Army. And over the years after Vietnam, a series of monographs and, and studies were done on different aspects of, uh, of the Indochina War. And I latched onto those and got those uh, um, downloaded and have studied those. Cambodian incursion written by the uh, operations officer of the South Vietnamese uh, General Staff. Uh, mounted combat by General Don Starry. Starry, Commander Tradoc. In the end, Starry was a Colonel Commander of the 11th Armored Cab Regiment during this Cambodian uh, episode. Uh, Air Mobility, John, uh, Lieutenant General John Tolston had a lot to do with the founding of the, uh, the 1st Air Cavalry. Uh, Graham Cosmos was a historian for the Army Center of Military History. I got to know him in my former years, actually when I was director of the Military History Institute, more specifically, and of course the history of the, of the uh, 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 Joint Chiefs of Staff of the U.S. Armed Forces. So all those studies that gave me a lot of background information at the higher level. And then uh, there are some secondary sources that I, that I turned to. Uh, Keith uh, Nolan, Cambodia into Cambodia, a very, a very good account, tells the broader picture of primarily the U.S. involvement. And then he concludes the South Vietnamese, summons of the trumpet, Dave uh, Richard Palmer. Palmer wrote that book as a colonel, and it's one of the first books that I took up to read about the Vietnam War boy back, uh, I'm going to say, back in the, in the, must have been the late, uh, no, middle 70s, middle 70s. John Westmoreland and his memoirs, A Soldier Reports, um, a little special connection there in that, uh, as we alluded to in the teaser, I had the opportunity when I was teaching uh, military history as assistant professor of military science at the University of Nebraska, an opportunity to invite General Westmoreland to come and speak to our military history class. And I'll be damned if he didn't come. He and his wife, Kitsy, came to Lincoln and we spent a couple of days and a couple of evenings together. And he and I had a chance to reminisce. Now understand, he was not commander of MACV when, uh, when we did the Cambodian operation. But as you'll see, he'll be, he'll be involved with a lot of work up to it. Um, Bob Sorley, A Better War, talks uh, more toward uh, Westmoreland's uh, successor, uh, General Creighton Abrams. And uh, Bob, is noted for his, his great detail in his, uh, in his work, in, in, uh, in his research. When I was director of MHI and Bob Sorley would be there doing um, work on his various projects, for a long period of time, I thought he was a member of, a, of, the, of the staff at MHI because he was there so often. Bob would be out there tonight, uh, say hello to you and, and, and thanks for the books, help me out. And then finally at the bottom, you see there's a little label there that says the Go Devil, and that was a magazine, a newspaper published every two weeks by the 3rd Brigade, 9th Infantry Division. We were the Go Devil Brigade, and that's the story. There's time, we'll tell it. But uh, they give a lot of uh, information on dates when things happen in terms of their reporting. So let's walk down the Ho Chi Minh Trail. We hear a lot about this uh, Ho Chi Minh Trail in the history of uh, uh, Vietnam, history of Indochina Wars, uh, the uh, resupply route. You know, they tell the story of two young ladies, each given a pair of mortar rounds and the sack of rice and instructed to keep moving down south, down the trails, and until you come to this place and drop off those two mortar rounds and then walk back, and we'll give you two more. Well, it was a heck of a lot more sophisticated than that. Now, these folks with the bicycle parade here, all right, that's one way to do it. But, you know, there was a lot to it, a lot more to it than what that was, too. Uh, look at here. We got trucks moving down here across the fords, carrying uh, down the Ho Chi Minh Trail, carrying supplies uh, to uh, the communist troops down in the south. And, uh, in fact, when we go into Cambodia, we'll encounter large uh, uh, numbers of trucks, truck parks, that will be destroyed, identified and destroyed. Uh, in fact, there'll be in, in like new uh, GMC trucks that uh, were traced back to the Korean War, sold a surplus after the Korean War, reconditioned, 
went to China and then ended up in Vietnam carrying supplies up and down the Ho Chi Minh Trail. So that's kind of how some of that stuff worked. So Ho Chi Minh Trail is going to be the supply route that is going to carry the supplies down into the uh, base areas established in the sanctuaries along the Cambodian South Vietnam border and a lot of activity. Uh, there's also going to be, as we'll see here, a lot of covert uh, air ops by the U.S. Air Force uh, against these uh, convoys. General Westmoreland, uh, I remember MACV was established back in 62. Um, General Paul Harkins was the first commander and, and he'll be replaced by, by General, uh, General Westmoreland. And in his book, he writes, and he and I talked about some of this, uh, uh, my visit with him, understand I didn't do an interview with him. I wasn't that astute back in those days <laughs> to be able to do that. But it was just sitting down before dinner and during dinner. Uh, we didn't talk much about it during dinner with the ladies present, but before dinner and afterwards, we talked about uh, about these uh, uh, the problem that he had as MACV commander and the problem with the, with the border areas because I had related to him, you know, the fact that uh, I'd gone in uh, in the Cambodia in 70. And so in his book, he says, by maintaining the base camps there, the enemy could regroup, retrain, mass his forces with impunity uh, for strikes inside South Vietnam. We couldn't touch them. Cambodia was neutral. And under international law, we couldn't, we couldn't go in there. And the various presidents were very concerned about that. And so, no, we didn't. But things are going to loosen up. But he says several occasions, I ask authority and do this and do that. And in the end, even though the JCS, the Joint Chiefs, agreed with him, State Department always vetoed it. And trying to keep, uh, trying to keep, I guess, presidential authority out of, out of getting in trouble. Well, there were some other things apart from going into Cambodia that could be done. One of those was Operation Market Time, and you can see here on the map uh, of, uh, of Vietnam, Cambodia, Laos, Thailand. There on the coastal area, you can see the lines coming down of the shipping that comes from the north down to the south and into the ports into the into uh, not only the ports but uh, just into the backwaters of all these streams all these rivers and, and, and canals that empty into the sea the south china sea and uh so the idea was to cut down on the on the shipping uh to bring in supplies to the communists in the south by that method so that was that was operation market time requested by general westmoreland approved by the jcs uh, started in 1965. Uh, 1966, 75% of the enemy resupply in the South came along from the sea. Early 67, it had been reduced to 10%. And that's the effectiveness of these operations conducted by the U.S. Navy and the U.S. Coast Guard with their cutters and with their aircraft of patrolling and the whole coastline, 1,100 miles of it, was divided up uh, uh, in, in, in sectors and uh, religiously uh, um, patrolled and turned back uh, by, by our forces. Uh, so Operation Market Time was going on, but it soon became apparent if you, um, if you look down over here, you see here's uh, the port at Sea of and you can see from the port from the coastal area, you can see these arrows coming inland, again into the sanctuary areas. And they are going to be joined by these coming down the Ho Chi Minh Trail into the sanctuary areas. And so trying to get all the stuff stopped up here at, uh, at uh, Sienuckville is going, to be, is going to be part of the operation. So what else can be done about that? Well, we got to find out where these base areas are. So to do that, we're going to have a little organization called MACB SOG. The Studies and Observation Group, uh, established in uh, January of 1964. And they're going to be a subsidiary of, uh, of, of MACV in the sense that, that they're there, and the missions are drawn up by MACV, but MACV cannot approve. They cannot approve uh, 
permission, they can't grant permission for these operations to be conducted. They're planned there, but they're approved in Washington at the Secretary of Defense level. Again, we're dealing with these guys, cross-border ops, going from Vietnam into Cambodia, into a neutral country. And so everything is really carefully considered. So what's going on here with these guys? Well, this is uh, special forces led teams of indigenous mercenary uh, soldiers of different ethnic tribes uh, throughout the Vietnam and Cambodia, primarily Montagnard, uh, the, the Hung uh, tribes are gonna contribute their young men as fighters. You see, they don't like the Vietnamese because uh, there's a very ethnic-based uh, uh, hostility there between these tribesmen, these indigenous tribesmen, and, uh, if you will, the, the, uh, the native uh, uh, Vietnamese, uh, ethnic Vietnamese, I should say. And so they're going to be formed into teams, as you are, as I reflected here, led by, trained and led by U.S. Army Special Forces, uh, Green Berets. And they are going to be involved in uh, conducting the cross-border operations on the ground to derive the locations of these base areas and to see what's going on. They're involved in, again, this is all covert stuff, 67 to 71, it's reconnaissance, it's search and rescue for downed uh, pilots. It's psycho uh, psychological operations. Um, and you see there a green line that I've attempted to draw on a black and white map indicates the border between South Vietnam and Cambodia. South Vietnam to the right, Cambodia to the left. And then some red uh, areas there that I've uh, sketched in that are inclusive of the base areas that uh, the SOG missions are going to identify. And the area is divided into two parts. Prairie Fire was the code name for the areas conducted in Laos. Uh, and Daniel Boone, first Daniel Boone, and then it was renamed Salem House, will be the areas that will be conducted in Cambodia. So we got 577 Salem House missions in 1970 alone. And so it's from these missions, these reconnaissance missions across the border into Cambodia that are going to identify the base areas that we're going to attack on the 1st of May, 1970. Very important part of, of intelligence gathering. Of course, you know, what we're dealing with here up at Carlisle and, and AHEC is telling the Army story one soldier at a time. So I want to do a little bit of Army heritage here. Here's some SOG veterans. Uh, on the uh, left, uh, Colonel Arthur Bull uh, Simmons. Uh, he uh, is most noted for being the guy that's going to put together the raid in 1970 to go after the prisoners of war to Song Te Prison in North Vietnam. And you rem may remember that they're going to train and train and train and they're going to do it all right, but by the time they get there, the prisoners have been moved. And so it's going to come to nothing. And uh, he's also going to be involved in, in some other some other activities after uh, uh, the war. Specifically, he's going to be recruited by Ross Perot to go into uh, uh, one of the Middle Eastern countries to uh, to reclaim some employees of Ross Perot's empire, uh, some of his employees, and, and so he's going to be involved in that. Um, Sergeant Major Master, Master Sergeant. Benavidez will receive uh, ultimately the award of the Medal of Honor in 1981 for an action in 1968 where uh, a SOG team will be surrounded by a battalion of uh, NVA and they'll radio for help and he then will, not involved in the action yet, he will rush to the scene uh, uh, and uh, help rescue uh, most of the guys in that team, and for that action, then he will receive the uh, the uh, the Medal of Honor, and so that's uh, that's all part of part of our Army heritage. And these guys did a great job, great job with that. So the base areas identified by both the ground recon and aerial recon, I've 
circled them in red, identified on the map. The blue dash line, again, represents the border between uh, South Vietnam to the right, Cambodia to the left. And as you look at the map, we can envision different things. It's like looking at the clouds. You might see a different shape animal in the clouds. But you look at the map, where the border runs, and so we get uh, areas named geographic areas like the fish hook, the dog's head the parrot's peak, the angel's wing. And so this is the areas that we're gonna, this, high, this attack that we're gonna make, we're gonna go, go into, gonna go into the fish hook. There you see just below the fish hook, it's I, Mimut, uh, and Highway 7. And in that area, between base area 353 and 352, all the way up to the city, up towards Snool, that's the area where uh, we're gonna go in here shortly. But uh, those are, in fact, uh, the base areas. So once the base areas are identified, we had Operation Market Time, which was the naval uh, presence, uh, uh, Navy and uh, Coast Guard. Now we're going to get we're going to get the uh, Air Force involved in covert bombing of the base areas, and this is all part of Operation Menu. Operation Menu, uh, different base areas will receive a different code name. And the menu runs from breakfast through dessert all day long, where you've got B-52 bombers staging in from Guam, some from Okinawa, some from Thailand, will be coming in usually in, in, in what we call cells of three uh, aircraft. They're going to come in um, on, a, on a bombing mission. Now, the, again, this is covert air bomb bargaining. We, we, we were going in and bombing a neutral country. So how's that happen? Well, the missions will be ordered up and sent to Washington for approval. And they're based on a series of coordinates. The coordinates are in Vietnam. En route to the target, there is a uh, ground radar station um, near Saigon, Air Force run, that will then contact the pilots give them a new set of coordinates that are in Cambodia. And so they will then fly their mission on the base areas. Um, in that period, 18 March to, of 69 to May of 70, 3,800 B-52 stories, 180,000 tons of bombs will be dropped in the base areas. And I can tell you that uh, there's a lot of damage here. When we get down the road here, and we start moving our APCs and our tanks through the base areas. Guess what? The mess that the bombers leave is a problem, a big problem. We're just going to drop that thought on you. We'll come back and pick it up here in a few minutes. So we're going to bomb them. We're going to cut off the coastline. And uh, we're going to close up the port at uh, Sea the Prince. Noro Dam what a character this guy is. At various times, he was king twice. He named himself president once in between being king. Uh, and he claimed international neutrality for Cambodia, but guess what? Not really. He was heavily favored toward the communist regimes uh, in uh, Hanoi, Beijing, and in uh, Moscow. And so he courted their, uh, their influence and allowed the NBA and the Viet Cong to establish space areas and sanctuaries in neutral Cambodia. So it's wearing him down though. Once he lets them in, they want more. They want more territory. They want more, more of the Cambodian territory. They are displacing uh, Cambodian citizens. From, from the land to create their base areas. Uh, they are impressing Cambodian citizens into, uh, into the service of, uh, of the North Vietnamese army. Uh, and uh, he's, he's getting kind of tired of this. So he goes to Moscow to get Moscow to deal with Beijing, you know, kind of cut back on some of this stuff. But while he's gone, his prime minister, Lon Noel says, well, you just stay up here, buddy, because we're taking over, and we're going to change things. There's a new sheriff in town, 
and you just stay out. You're deposed, and the line no takes over takes over the government. Now, what's he gonna do about it? Well, he's got a Cambodian army of about thirty thousand men, and uh, they're not. Um, how can I say? Uh, top quality. They're not as good as the NBA soldiers that are running around, running around through the country. So he's going to say, "Hell, hey, U.S., we need we need some help to keep things under control." Let's get in here with General Abrams, great neighbors, Army Heritage, another great guy. I mean, I tell you. He is a, here's a guy who was, a, he was a tank battalion commander in World War II. By the way, Westmoreland was an artillery battalion commander in World War II. You know, I served in the Army a good share of my time uh, under uh, the command of, of guys who were, who were World War II veterans. Went back that, went back that far. Um, I had a battalion commander when I was a captain who was a World War II, World War II veteran. I had sergeants. Uh, the sergeant that trained us at BMC, um, um, Master Sergeant Bainey. Bainey? That's over 50 years ago. And I still remember the guy's name. That's because he was that good that he's committed to memory. So uh, General uh, Abrams will succeed General Westmoreland as commander of MACV. Uh, and referring to the base camps, you can read the quotation there. Should the enemy be denied a sanctuary in these base areas, major portion of the threat to South Vietnam could be neutralized. Denial of these base areas by some means appears to be a prior, a prerequisite for the realization of U.S. objectives in South Vietnam. What are the U.S. objectives in South Vietnam now, at this point, at this stage of the game in 1969? Well, the objectives are Vietnamization. Create the Vietnamese, South Vietnamese Army to the point, train them to the point, equip them to the point they can stand on their own. Our boys can go home and go back to the world. That's the objective. But those base areas that are still in existence, yeah, that's probably not going to happen. We need to get rid of the base areas. Finally, along comes a guy that's willing to deal with it. President Richard Nixon. He understands the sentiments of Abrams. He understands the sentiments of others. He's got his advisor there, uh, Henry Kissinger, National Security Advisor. And uh, unfortunately, Nixon and his Secretary of Defense, Melvin Laird, and Mr. Rogers, the Secretary of State, they don't agree with what Nixon is thinking about doing. And they kind of hold back. They're kind of pushing. He's getting some pushback from them. Uh, Lon Noll gives, once he gets control of the country, he gives the NBA the Viet Cong 72 hours to get out of, get out of Dodge. And they refuse. I mean, look at those guys standing there, right? You think they're ready to leave? They're not leaving. Yeah. So Cambodia uh, and the person of Lon Noll asks the USA for help. So preparation meets opportunity. We did some planning back a year ago, 1969. And now here we are in March, April, 1970. Okay, got a little different situation going on. And President Nixon uh, realized, recognized that the upheaval in Cambodia uh, made the U.S. action both possible and necessary. Time to go, time to implement, implement the plan. What's the plan? I go back to the uh, operations officer of uh, the uh, South Vietnamese General Staff uh, Tron Dinh Tho and his plan. On the left is a map. Uh, on the left is a map uh, of Cambodia and Vietnam. Again, the blue dash line is uh, the, the border between uh, Cambodia and South Vietnam. Uh, in the upper part, the light blue colored, are U.S. forces. The first, the first cavalry division and 25th infantry division. Uh, are going to conduct an attack basically up there to, uh, to the north. Over there, a little further to the left, then down, are the green arrows of the South Vietnamese that are going to be involved uh, in, the, in the operation. You've got um, about 19,000 U.S. troops going to be involved in here, in here and 10,000 South Vietnamese. 
So the initial attack over there on the right, I say Task Force Shoemaker, uh, is named for a assistant division commander of the 1st Cavalry Division, uh, Brigadier General Handsome Bob Shoemaker. Handsome Bob, that's his nickname, is going to be in command of a very sizable force that's going to go in. He's 1st Cavalry Division. Uh, operating under his operational control, apart from the 1st, the, uh, the 3rd Brigade of the 1st Cav, and then also the 2nd later on, He'll have other forces from other units. He'll have uh, the uh, 11th Armored Cavalry Squadron uh, or 11th Armored Cavalry Regiment composed of three squadrons. The regiment commanded by, as I said earlier, General Don Starry. He'll have a battalion from the 25th Division, the Battalion of Tanks. I say a battalion. Um, there should be 54 tanks in that battalion, but there aren't. There are about half that many. Uh, one of their companies has been detached, never will come back again. They fight in a different area, but they have some big business problems in the second of the 34th Armor. Uh, but uh, they're going to give it a shot. And then you've got 2nd Battalion, 47th Infantry Regiment, and that's where I was. That's where I was. At this time, uh, as we get ready to go to Cambodia, I've been bumped up from platoon leader to executive officer that is second in command of Bravo Company of the 2nd Battalion, 47th Infantry. But uh, I'm going to talk about that unit here in just a tick. Just a tick. So the plan is uh, we're going to go in on a ground attack supported by an entire brigade of uh, Arvin Infantry, air mobile into three objective areas, and then you got uh, a squadron, first of the ninth air cap, we're going to screen to the north, and we're going to go in there and uh, and make the attacks. We got three objectives assigned A, B, and C. You see, there's a little thing there, uh, Kospin, that is the central office of South Vietnam. That's the Viet Cong is uh, in communist uh, uh, administrative and command control headquarters that was rumored to be present in the area through which we're going to attack. And if we can take down that headquarters, it is a great thing. That's right? very elusive. We've been after it for years, but we think now we've got it. So we're going to let everybody kind of get in position. We're going to drop back about some other things. Let's talk about 2nd Battalion, 47th Infantry Regiment. That was my home for a year. Uh, the battalion, about 900 soldiers. Centerpiece of the battalion is uh, the rifle companies, Alpha, Bravo, and Charlie. Um, each company has three platoons. Uh, the platoons officially should have 44 men. I never had as a platoon leader more than 38. Um, the platoon, a platoon will have four M113 armored personnel carriers called APCs or we'll call them tracks. Um, made up of three 11 man squads. They have each 113 has a 50 caliber machine gun. Um, and each um, platoon has two M60 machine guns, at least, if not more. More on that later. But M16 rifles, M72 grenade launchers were the personal uh, uh, individual weapons uh, for, for the soldier. We are infantry. We are mechanized infantry. In other words, we have these armored personnel carriers that assist us in our combat operations. So the uh, three infantry, infantry, you have three rifle platoons in an infantry company, plus a mortar platoon of 81 millimeter mortars. Uh, and they are mounted in a M113 derivative vehicle uh, as well. So we've got mobility, mobility. Everything is mobile. You've got uh, Air Mobile Infantry, the, uh, the uh, Arvin, the South Vietnamese Army uh, um, Air Mobile Brigade that's going to be used. Uh, you've got a U.S. Uh, recon squadron of helicopters that's going to be used, uh, an attack squadron. And then you've got, uh, you've got the 11th Armored Cab Regiment, the 2nd and the 34th Armored 247. We're all mobile, ha fast, hard-hitting. We can carry a lot of ammunition on, on those, and more on that here in a little, little bit. So in addition to the three rifle companies on the left, you've got the headquarters company, 
a scouting scout or reconnaissance platoon. They're equipped with what we call ACAVs. They're an M113 der derivative. They have the caliber machine gun, plus they have two M60 machine guns mounted uh, on either side uh, to add to, to their firepower. There's also 407 uh, millimeter mortars to support the battalion. A flame platoon, call them Zippos. Again, 113 derivative that carries each track. Uh, has a tank, air pressure tank, uh, and a 200 pound tank of uh, basically napalm. And it's a mounted flamethrower. So maintenance, commo, Delta Company, sport platoon, medical platoon, mess teams. So, so that's the battalion uh, operation. Uh, three rifle companies, nine rifle platoons, 18 light machine gun teams, 27 uh, 10 man squads, and six, six uh, man scout teams. 42 APCs, six ACAVs, nine mortars, uh, nine light uh, medium mortars, four heavy mortars. So that's my home uh, 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 for this story. What about the men? Well, here they are. There they are. Look, I even remember some of their names. You see, these are the guys that made up uh, made up the company and uh, the companies and, and, and platoons. And um, you know, we got a lot uh, a lot of misconceptions out there about these wars and and, and, and the soldiers. Um, people think of uh, because of the books like the Red Badge of Courage, American Civil War. You got bunch of 18, 19 year old teenagers out there running around fighting the Civil War. Wrong, wrong. Um, average age of the Civil War soldier was 25 years and 10 months, not quite 26 years old. Second World War average age of the soldier was 26, was, 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 was 26 years. Same kind of as the Civil War. Vietnam War, again, I say when I took command of my platoon in late December of 1969, I just turned 23 years old. When I took command of the platoon, I became the oldest man of the platoon right away. I was the oldest man of the platoon. So these are young men. And the young men, they're not boys. You grow up fast in this kind of environment that we uh, we, we existed in. Over here on the left, you've got, uh, well, there's Rooney again. Um, he's uh, in a lot of pictures. And you got his arms around uh Doom is the is the guy on his uh right and i can't remember the other guy's name but they were some more of our tiger scouts that fought with us and we were very pleased to have them along with us so uh, i was in bravo company here's a guy from alpha company i know i i mean we didn't know each other back then his name is ray hinchy and uh ray was a as you can see he was a m16 machine gunner and i know ray I had to talk with him last night, talking about what, I don't know, Ray, if you're out there, hey, buddy, welcome home. Um, and so there's uh, there's Ray, doesn't he look good? Huh? Uh, so uh, I'm a personnel carrier. I give you a couple of different views. The one on the lower left was my personal one as platoon leader. Um, you notice above that one on the left, you see the guys riding on top. Uh, and uh, again, on the other side, on the right top, you see the guys that, those are A caps there on the right. You can see the M60 machine gun right in uh, there. Um, to, and in addition to the 50 calendar, there's another M60 on the other side. We rode on top of these vehicles rather than in the vehicles. Why? Because the biggest threat we had uh, uh, in this war to these vehicles were uh, landmines. And so we would ride on top. We would sandbag the interior of the uh, the floor of the of the carrier of the track, and then uh, it was also not uncommon to have uh, belly armor bolted underneath between the tracks. It went about two thirds of the way down the vehicle uh, on the underside to protect it from detonation of any landmines that we might go over, and and. Uh, um, cause damage to the vehicle. Of course, the the, uh, the belly armor reduced the uh, uh, the uh, 
ability to cross over obstacles because you don't have as much as much clearance there underneath the vehicle and also increase the weight and kind of threw off the horsepower to weight ratio of, of the uh, of the diesel engine but those are the vehicles are going to give us armored protection up to uh, uh, heavy machine gun it's aluminum alloy armor it's our first armored personnel carrier made of aluminum alloy as opposed to steel armor and as a consequence it's a lot lighter than what we formerly had in the m59 apc and um, this is probably uh you know you watch the history channel and they come up with the 10 best weapons of the 10 best vehicles and all that this is number one for armored combat vehicles uh armored infantry vehicles i should say uh number one in their estimation lower right um uh, show you a 113 in cambodia with a recallless rifle, 106 millimeter recallless rifle mounted on it. What's that all about? Well, when we uh, uh, left our base camp in the Delta to go up, uh, eventually we didn't know where we were going, but we ended up going into Cambodia. As we cleared out that base camp, we found an extra 106 millimeter recallless rifle, and I was down in platoon strength in my in, uh, in my platoon and and. Uh, so we mounted uh, that recalls rifle on uh, the fourth spare track that we had. And, uh, and so 106 millimeter fired um, high explosive ammunition, armor piercing ammunition, but it also fired anti-personnel rounds, what we call flechettes. And uh, 106 millimeter recalls rifle, the 90 millimeter uh, tank uh, gun, uh, artillery, 105 millimeter artillery, fired anti-personnel rounds called flechettes. A flechette is a uh, steel arrow about an inch to an inch and a half long. And you got a couple thousands of them in each, in each projectile. And so we used to use the 106 millimeter as an anti-sniper weapon. Yeah, you got some dude up the tree that's shooting at you, hard to see. Well, if you can figure out about where he is, and you can fire that 106 millimeter up into the tree at him. Doesn't you don't have to be point pinpoint accuracy. That baby's gonna those, those flesh outs are gonna spread out and they're gonna bring him down. Key thing about the 113 was it gave us uh, a mobile, highly powerful machine gun. Uh, the Browning machine gun, caliber 50, M2 heavy barrel, effective range, 2,000 yards. Can shoot over 8,000 yards, but effective range is limited by you know, the machine gunner, the operator, and your range of vision, you see. Uh, rate of fire, pretty rapid, 450, 600 rounds, rounds per minute. So that's that uh, operation. Weapons, rifle, grenade launcher, machine gun. These are the individual weapons with which we were equipped. So we're going to move 17 April. We're going to leave our base camp in Ben Foot, which is below Saigon, uh, down in the Delta. We're going to move up to Bearcat base camp. And uh, we don't know yet what's going on. It's the 17th of April, but we're moving up to Bearcat in uh, the Nantroc dist uh, district. We're going to do some ops up there for a few days. And it won't be long, 28th of April, we move again. This time we move up toward the Cambodian border. From Bearcat, we move up to Tain In. And uh, you can see there, there again, I got some of the boys named and because you don't, you know, this thing about Band of Brothers, uh, it's real. It's a real, it's a real deal. It's the real deal. So you remember these guys. You lived with them. You fought with them. That's what it was. That's why I know who these boys are. And so, we can move up toward the uh, Cambodian border. And this is what it looks like, picture on the left, one I took, this is uh, TL4 going up to a place called Khatoum. Khatoum was a former Special Forces in Sid G base camp. That is, uh, Special Forces with the indigenous uh, mercenary fighters had a, a base camp there. Uh, and then uh, later on, that'll be uh, uh, built up as, a, as an airfield. This thing, uh, this place received so much uh, 
rocket fire and mortar fire from the Cambodian side of the border, not too far away, that they didn't call it Katoom, they call it Kaboom. And that's, and you can see the area just been pounded. On the right, you see some 11th Armored Cav Regiment Combat Engineers demining a road. Very perilous kind of duty. Uh, and that's what the terrain, I show you that because I show you what the terrain looked like after all the fighting that's going on now. This is 1970. And so you've got fighting that's been going on in this area since 1966. And probably back at the first Indochina War, you've got fighting in some of this area. So let's go to the night of the 30th. This is the night before we go in. And so what is going to happen, we're all lined up, and there we are. Uh, two four sevens up there on the left. Two three four armor, the 11th ACR. First uh, squadron hadn't come up yet. And overnight, uh, we're going to get some bombing. And early morning, uh, some bombing again. And what's going to happen in the morning is um, just before it gets the sun comes up, we all gather at the company commander's armored personnel carrier and uh, for confirmation of the op order and, and final checks and make everything ready. And we're sitting there, we're inside his, his personnel carrier because uh, it's still kind of dark and we don't want too much light to get out. So we're, we're sitting in there. And he gets to the point where he says, okay, boys, he says, that's it now. He said, if anything happens to me, he said, Lieutenant Boss will be in command of the company. Okay, well, that's expected. I was the executive officer. I was second in command. I was expected, but I, I tell you what, him saying that, I got the shakes. I did, I got the shakes. And then I looked around inside of that carrier and the other guys in there with me, the other, the, the, uh, the, uh, the platoon leaders and Sam Landreth, the company commander, <laughs> they're shaking too. What the, what's this? <laughs> what's this all about? I mean, this carrier is bouncing. A 12-ton vehicle is kind of bouncing up and down on the ground. <clears throat> what's going on here? And so we jump out and look over on the horizon. It's a low cloud cover. And the sun, again, the sun isn't up. And underneath those clouds, it's all orange and red. And then the sound catches up with the vibrations from the ground. That's what the shakes were. That was a ground vibrate, right? Then you got this color, and then the sound catches up to it. And these bombers are coming down the line again, one more drop just before we go in. And they're just bombing the crap out of it. And so what that reminds me of, you see, you know, you think about um, you guys, I was with a group of, and some of you may be out there tonight, uh, last uh, year in uh, Normandy. And we did six days over there uh, with, with a great, a great uh, battlefield guy, and uh, and so it reminded me of those guys coming in, you know, watching the bombing and the naval gunfire, and thinking, "Man, nobody's going to live through that crap." And by the time you, know, you get there, you know, they're, they're living all right. And so anyway, they bombed it. We're ready to go. So let's get cranked up. We go across the border. First of May. Picture on the left again. It's one I took from the APC that I'm in, I'm shooting over the camera shots right over the heads, right over the heads of the guys here, sitting on the back of the track that I'm in, and looking at these boys. This is what we call elephant grass. You can't see a doggone thing, <laughs> except the vehicle behind you, or a vehicle in front of you, if there's a vehicle in front of you. And, and, and then you got the bombers, when they came through, when they hit the wooded areas, this is fairly open. That's why all the grass is there. But you get down in the trees, the grass isn't there, but the trees have been cut down. The trees have been cut down by these bombs that have a standoff where the trees are cut off about three feet above the ground. And the remainder of the tree, the tall part of the tree, is laying, side, laying on the ground sideways. And, you know, there were engineers back uh, years and years ago that worked hard to fell trees to create abatis, a French name. It's an obstacle. And they were perfect abatis. And our torsion bars on those carriers were just rounded and growing as we tried to make our way through here. And we we're supposed to be real fast and mobile. Well, we weren't that morning. We weren't that morning. We were slowed down because of all the, all the stuff. You'd think you would have learned that. We think Operation Cobra, World War II, to break out from Normandy Beach 
They had the same problem in 1944. We just did the same thing all over again in 1970. But anyway, we persevere, we struggle on, here we go. So the red box there on the map, that shows you where, where uh, about where this area was here. Here's another shot. This is one, again, we're going into the sanctuary. Yes, what's in the sanctuary area? Well, there are store and supplies there. You got training bases there. This is a training base that um, uh, we uh, had been hit by the bombers and we finished up, we cleaned it up. And if you can make out, it's kind of a smoky picture there. Got some a lot of smoke that morning. Uh, there's a tank in there. It's one of our tanks because mm -hmm. what we did is we crossed the tanks. We put tanks with infantry, infantry with tanks. We went in as combat teams. And those are the tanks from the 2nd and the 34th Armored. And uh, so that's uh, that's what the area that's what the area looked like as we went through. Let's jump ahead. First day. Oh, well, well, let me say about the first day. First day was really limited contact limited contact because um, I think, we think, I mean, everyone all writes about this thing that they figured out we were coming. And uh, so they left some stay behind forces there to delay us. So we were fighting kind of a delaying action. Uh, our battalion, all total for the 45 days we're in, uh, we took about 100, it was 155 uh, enemy KIA. So we're not talking about some real, really hard gunfights here. It was sporadic over 45 days. But we went in the training area. It's just like if you, uh, those of you with military service, if you remember the training bases, you go out to any train, any range at Fort Benning or, or Fort Hood or, or whatever, Air Force Base or Marine Base. And it's just like those bases, except they're not they're quite as, as fancy. But, I mean, they got chalkboards and they got... Uh, they got map boards and they've got chairs and they got tables and they got hospitals and they got they got medicine for the hospitals shipped in it. Uh, the containers are still stamped with uh, Air France uh, baggage slips. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Um, so all the way from France, Air France, yeah, yeah, coming in to support these people. So that's that's what we ran into. Um, I'm going to jump ahead to five May. Long on time here. Here's a here's a different kind of vehicle. It's a Sheridan light tank M551. Uh, Sheridan light tank, part of the 11th Armored Cav uh, outfit, and 11th ACR uh, and 247. You know, it's here's the 5th of May. You don't see second to 34th Armor anymore. They were pulled out because their tanks kept breaking down, and. Uh, and so they were they were pulled out, so we were on our own, but it was us and two, two, three, four between Mimut and Snool. Uh, that's that's who was there. And the 11th ACR found a uh, base area called the, the city, the city base camp. And there's kind of a map of it, but uh, that base camp was 182 bunkers, uh, storage bunkers. Looking at my notes here. Um, 182 storage bunkers, each was 16 feet long, 10 feet wide, 8 feet deep, full, filled with supplies. And I list there on the inventory is, is the is what they inventoried was in those bunkers. And so the way, uh, the condition of the place as, as the 11th this year I found it, that place had been there two, two and a half years. Uh, and so that was a major, major supply base. We found a lot of smaller ones than this. This was, this was the city, this was the big one, but it's typical of once we go into the sanctuary, it's typical of what we uh, of what we're going to find. So as we go in there, as with any war, uh, there's another problem that we had to deal with. That's this one. Um, Cambodian people, they've been displaced now by the NVA establishing base areas uh, where they live. 
They've been forced out. Their food has been taken from them, right? Look at the map. Look at the photograph on the left. These are kids coming in to get food. Here's my buddy Ray Hinchy standing there. I put a halo over his head. He's an angel. And, but the kids come in. The kids would come in with our clothes to pineapple. The parents would, you could see the parents in the background. Now these would come out in the open, but the parents would be back in the trees and pushing the kids toward us. The kids would come with arm loads of pineapple, wanting to trade the pineapple for our, our rations, our field rations, our sea rations. Well, what are you going to do? Huh? Yeah, you got to make that trade. Um, Barbara's not in the room here, but she can testify to this fact. I ate so much pineapple in those 45 days in Cambodia that it was 10 years after I got back home. 10 years before I got to eat pineapple. Uh, no, I love it, yeah, but, but not back then. So we had to deal with these with these refugees. All these uh, caches of, of rice, we would enlist these people, those bags are heavy, to load up the rice on, we'd bring, bring, in, uh, bring in big stick and uh, platform trucks uh, and, and pile the rice on, but we always gave the people more than their fair share of rice back because it was probably their rice to begin with, you see. Uh, and so that was uh, something we had to deal with. Now, meanwhile, back at the ranch, you know, we're going into Cambodia um, in the morning of the 1st of May, right? Now, back in the world, it's still the 30th of April, <laughs> all right? And the President of the United States is on television giving a briefing. <laughs> and so it was kind of disconcerting that the big thing he's talking about is, is the, this, this Cospin, the, the central office of the South Vietnam, this communist uh, headquarters organization. That's, to him, that's the big target. Well, hell, they're, they're long gone. We're not going to catch up with them, you know? But so kind of disconcerting. Senators are angry. Really? How angry are the senators? Well, we're going to find out. Okay. Uh, after we, let's kind of sum up. I'm getting toward the end here, so I need to get Nancy, I know. Uh, U.S. casualties, 344 killed out of uh, 19,300 engaged, 159, or 1,500, almost 1,600 wounded. Um, estimated enemy casualties, a little over 11,000. Uh, a couple thousand captured or decided to turn themselves in to be repatriated. Uh, Put it in, in terms of uh, the soldier, the soldier's view, all right? And General Roberts, the commander of the uh, 1st Cavalry Division at the time, this is what he told his troops. He said, you kill enough of the enemy to man three of his regiments, three of his regiments, equivalent, gone. You captured, destroyed enough individual and crew served weapons to equip two NBA divisions. They're not going to take place. You deny the enemy an entire year's supply of rice for all the maneuver battalions in our area of operations. So if you break it down into those kind of terms to explain it to the soldier, they can understand that. And they understood. It. So from that standpoint, it was a good deal. What it did do at a, at a higher level, though, our time in there, and you had troops in there uh, uh, until the 29th of June. Um, we had to be out by the 30th. We were out by the 29th. So we were in there not quite 60 days. What we did is we forced all the enemy activity. Any activity in that area. Uh, hold on. In that area. We had a little accident. Let me back up. Uh, we forced all the enemy activity in the area uh, for for about a year, and what that enabled us to do 
then was continue on with the national objectives, which was the, uh, the uh, re-equipping the South Vietnamese Army, and then um, enabling us to, uh, to withdraw uh, forces and get back, uh, get back to normal. But there's some other things here. Sorry about this, folks. All right, congressional fallout from this, even though we did some great things in terms of, uh, as I say, holding the enemy back in that area, particularly in the area of the third and uh, fourth military regions. Um, for about a year, things were, things were fairly quiet, enabled us to, to pull, pull some, not all of our troops out, uh, beginning uh, right after the Cambodian op was, was, uh, was conducted. But meanwhile, back at the ranch, we've got congressional fallout. We've got the Cooper Church Amendment, uh, which sought to end the funding for the U.S. military activities in Cambodia. By the time they went through all that stuff and discussion, we were gone. We were out, we were back in Vietnam. So that didn't uh, pass in the Senate, but failed in the House. That didn't go. The Governor Hatfield Amendment um, dealt with funding the war. Talking about defunding police departments. Well, here they were going to defund the, the, the war making capability of, of the U.S. Uh, in terms of Vietnam and in terms of Indochina. Uh, what they wanted to do was uh, pass this amendment to end the war, which would uh, stipulate mandated deadlines, stipulate deadlines for certain things to be done, like withdrawals of certain units. Uh, ahead of when negotiations would be conducted with the North Vietnamese. And so it made absolutely no sense at all. And so opposed by the president, uh, it was defeated in the Senate on, uh, in September of 70. But then we do have a war powers resolution of 73, which is gonna take place of course later. Uh, it's gonna be vetoed. Uh, again, it's an attempt to control presidential power to commit the US to armed conflict. Um, and it's going to be vetoed by the president with the veto overridden. So all that in the end, what's going to happen is the Go Devils are going to go home. The Go Devil Brigade um, will be, we go back, we come out of Cambodia after 45 days, and we do some operations down uh, around Kuchi, stay, stay at Kuchi for a while, nice swimming pool, Kuchi. Ray, if you're out there, if you remember the swimming pool, a nice swimming pool, pretty cheap. But uh, we go on down to Nantrak district, southeast of uh, Saigon. We get involved in guarding the Rome plows. Rome plows, these huge bulldozers that were bulldozing, bulldozing the jungle. We didn't get involved in Agent Orange stuff. We just went, uh, guarded these bulldozers as they, as they destroyed the forest to, to increase visibility and, and that kind of thing. We did that and then Word came down that the brigade's going home, and uh, so we will. Uh, those of us that have been there long enough, I was one of those that uh, they uh, they put an honor guard for each of the uh, each of the four infantry battalions and the artillery battalion, and uh, they had twelve soldiers and one commissioned officer for each battalion and battalion colors. And as it turned out. The, the, the soldiers they picked were those that had been in country the longest as of that time. As it turned out, I was, a, I was in country the longest of the commissioned officers. And so I got uh, to bring home with 12 soldiers the battalion colors along with the colors of the other battalions of the brigade. And we came home to Fort Lewis, Fort Lewis, Washington. And, uh, and what happened after that? Well, let me talk about Ray. Ray Henchy. Ray didn't come home like I did. He uh, had some more time to serve, so he'll do some more time in Nam, but he finally will come back. He'll be sent like me. I went back to Benning. My wife Barbara stayed at Columbus, Georgia, there at the Infantry Center with the other waiting wives, so Fort Benning was our home there. And so I went home to Benning. Ray went to Benning. Ray actually uh, um, had some time left in the Army. And so he, he worked for a while. He served uh, in, as a Viet Cong soldier in the, in the Vietnamese village training camp where we were 
they're still pushing troops to Vietnam. And so Ray was there um, uh, applying what he had learned in Vietnam and Cambodia. And that's, that's, uh, that's probably a good way to do it is somebody has been there, been there, done that. And, and that's what he did. Finally, he's going to ETS. He's going back to Schuylkill County, Pennsylvania. Uh, he's going to go to college. Spends uh, two years there at the local Penn State campus, and then uh, two more years at, uh, at the Harrisburg campus. Gets his uh, bachelor's degree, teaching certificate, goes to teach high school, coaches girls basketball and softball, becomes eventually athletic director. And uh, his uh, school there at St. Clair, and uh, will come out to be a, a battlefield guide in 1998. And he's a fellow battlefield guide here again. For me, I uh, went back to Benning, like Ray, went into the training business uh, as a veteran trainer uh, with the weapons department. 73, um, the 9th Infantry Division was reactivated the brigade, the Go Double Brigade reactivated. Um, the regiment, 2nd Battalion, 47, reactivated. I took over command of Bravo Company, same company, same, same battalion. I was in Vietnam uh, in, at Fort Lewis, Washington. And then went on up and continued my, continued my service. So that's why two old soldiers never die. Old soldiers never die. They, some become battlefield guides. <laughs> and so, before I go, I want to just say one more thing. Uh, I've written my fourth and last book on the American Civil War. Uh, it'll be released by the publishers uh, September 1st. Uh, available now for pre-order from Amazon.com. It's co-authored with another uh, retired Army guy, uh, Colonel, actually Dr. Colonel Jeff McLaughlin, a former National Security Council staff person. and. Uh, and so we've been doing uh, leadership seminars on this battlefield now for about 10 years. And the book is a, is a uh, kind of a synthesis of our, what we've been doing this, in seminars. And so we look forward to that. I just mentioned that in case anybody's interested. And people have asked me about the beard. The beard has nothing to do with uh, Civil War. Uh, I've taken on a, a new persona and a new interest. Uh, I'll come back to the Civil I'll stay here around the Civil War. Of course, I live here in Gettysburg, but uh, uh, I've got some, some DNA that goes back to Scandinavia, and so I've taken out a new persona as a Viking, and uh, I'm getting there. All i got to do is the right, Kurt, find the right, the right helmet, and battle axe, we're going to go to work. Mike, I'm done. Okay. Can you speak a little bit more about how much the enemy seemed to be aware of your unit's upcoming incursion in Cambodia? Yeah. Um, before we went in, there are reports that there were convoys of trucks that were leaving the base areas loaded with supplies. They're heading west into Cambodia. Um, in other words, they were trying to evacuate as much as they could out of here before we went in. So what that, what, what the, what the big time authors and thinkers uh, believe is that, is that somehow they were tipped off. Now it might be that they were just astute enough to realize that Lon Nol taking over the government of Cambodia, keeping Sienuk keeping seeing look out, it was just going to be a matter of time anyway, before the U.S. came in. And so they would try to evacuate as much of their as much of their stuff as they could, and uh, they always had a problem too with with when I speak of these covert uh, bombing missions. There are allegations that um, the way those were administered, um, in other words, the coordinates for the strikes were changed in the air. Um, somehow some of that information got to the enemy and they stayed clear of the, of the area. Um, when we went in on the first, the first day, uh, we had no contact until the end of the day. We didn't have any gunfights until the end of the day and those that we had bypassed came back through us 
because they had, uh, we believe, some kind of indication that we were, we were, we were coming. One last question before we conclude tonight uh, comes from John. Did you guys work with MAT teams and their RF and PF counterparts? And since I don't know what the acronyms mean, I'll leave it up to you. <laughs> we, we worked with, with uh, uh, not in this op, not in this op, but uh, we worked extensively down in the Delta with, uh, with RFPF. Uh, Regional Forces, Popular Forces. Uh, we worked uh, a great deal with them and they were joint operations. In other words, they were learning, uh, if you will, they were learning from us. But they, these were the, if, if, if you think of the militia, think of a militia group here, you know, in the early part of the United States history. That's what these folks were. They were there and defending, guarding, protecting, fighting on their home turf, in their neighborhood. And so we worked a lot with them, passed on a lot of useful information, uh, useful techniques uh, to them. So that's, yeah. We do have one more, t a couple seconds for another question. How much did mechanical breakdown of your equipment impede the operation? Now, that depends uh, on, on who you were. We didn't have, uh, we didn't have that big a problem in in the, in the two four seven. Um, I mean, you know, you can't avoid all of that, but we didn't have rampant things happen like they did in the in the tank battalion. And uh, the tank battalion, unfortunately, the tank battalion was only in five days. In fact, General Starry himself writes about that particular battalion that they were only in the op five days before they had to pull out because of excessive breakdowns of their, of their tanks, of their equipment. And uh, they, were just plain, they were just plain worn out. And uh, I mean, I, I remember being there with them for five days, we had them with us and, uh, and they, did, uh, uh, they did good work, but, but they became a, a liability because if you, if you, I mean, if you can't move it, <laughs> you got a big problem. It's not like towing a Jeep, you know, back, back to the motor pool. Uh, and so they finally just evacuated all that they could move and towed out all that they, all that would not move on their own and just took the whole outfit out. But we didn't have, we didn't have that much of a, that much of a problem. Um, from a, from, from a maintenance standpoint. Well, Tom, I want to thank you. Uh, and uh, I know that Jeff McCausland was on the line too. Good luck with the publication of your book uh, coming up here. Uh, may it sell well and uh, may it wind up in our bookstore here at the Army Heritage Education Center. So uh, good night. Uh, good night everybody who joined us and, and please let other, know, uh, other folks know about this webinar series. We're going to be continuing it throughout the summer and into the fall. So again, Tom, thanks and talk to you soon. All right. Thanks, Mike.